Community Forum United Against Hate. Uh, we thank the, uh, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office for taking the time to come into Huntington and particularly giving us uh, th this forum. I'm very, very proud that we're having this forum in Huntington. But I imagine that for each of you as well, it breaks my heart that we even have to have it. Uh, we have issues that are going on across our country that are having an effect on our community. We are a community that is known for its level of compassion. And when we say that uh, we are open to all, uh, all means y'all, right? And to that point, uh, what we're simply wanting to make sure is that we're not just talking in a circle to one another, people who believe as we believe. The reality is, is that there are those who are seeking to divide. And we cannot allow that to, to happen. So we have a wonderful, we have a wonderful panel discussion available for us uh, today. And uh, beyond, beyond that, for us to be able to have the opportunity to talk with one another, uh, this is something that I believe can have long lasting effects for us. I was at another part of the state over the weekend and interestingly, a lady came up to me and said, so you've got a quite of, a, of an event in Huntington on Tuesday night. Now, honestly, my calendar is getting such right now, I'm not sure whether I'm going from the morning to the afternoon, much less a few days from then. And I went to look on the calendar and I saw that it was this, this event. And the way she knew about it is that she had heard about it on uh, West Virginia Public Radio. Individuals are watching. Just as importantly, individuals are listening. And what we have to do is make sure that we are, what we are taking from today is that we buckle ourselves up and go into the public with love in our heart, with determination on our mind, that we are going to make sure that hate does not g gain control in our city. To that point, I'm very proud to meet, to introduce to you a partner of mine, uh, Judge Will Thompson, uh, our U.S. Attorney in the Southern District of West Virginia, has proven to be a partner while he was a judge, but even more of a partner right now. And uh, thank you, Judge, for for bringing this to Huntington one more time and giving us an opportunity to talk and and be able to bolster ourselves. Uh, to be able to stand for, with love and to defeat hate. Ladies and gentlemen, Judge Will Thompson. Thank you, Mayor, uh, for that introduction, and thank you for helping us host this. And thanks to your Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee who also helped plan this forum. Uh, as the Mayor said, we had a forum basically to plan this a few months ago, had a good community turnout, and I hope we have good interactions today. Um, and we all leave here, number one, knowing what a hate crime is, knowing how to report it, what to do if it happens, if you see it happen. And also, hopefully, we learn something from it as well, some of the concerns the community might have and better ways we can address them. Uh, I want to go through some housekeeping things. Number one, the event is being recorded, and it's going to be uploaded to the city's YouTube page as a training tool for any interested communities and uh, also for people who might want to see it who couldn't be here tonight. Uh, we, my office will be sharing pictures of the event through social media to help promote the event. Uh, over here on my right, uh, there's a table, there's some privacy consents there. If you do not wish uh, to be included in any of the social media posts or anything of that nature, Make sure someone from my office knows that, and we'll have to uh, make sure make sure that happens that you're not tagged in one of those events. Uh, program agenda and handouts are also located at the information table. As the mayor said, we're going to have a really good uh, community. Well, we hope to be a really good community forum, and the way we're doing that, if you notice at your tables, there are questions 
platform. We're going to ask you if you have a question to fill those out. Uh, we'll collect those before the forum starts, and then we will hand those over to the uh, members of the forum uh, to answer. Um, we're doing this because we do have a limited amount of time, and as though I love audience interaction, when we've got 50 minutes set aside for a community forum, we could lose that in two or three questions. And I would like to get through as many of the questions as possible, so that's why we're writing the questions down so we can answer them. In the event uh, that we cannot answer your question or it doesn't get uh, to the forum, please let me know, and I'll be happy to reach out to you directly, answer the question the best I can. If I can't answer it, I'll put you in touch with someone who can. Uh, the whole purpose of this right here is to educate the community. So we want people's questions to be answered. And we want as many of them as we can by the forum, but you know, there could be some time constraints. Um, there are some resources in the back of the room. Um, I would ask each of y'all to take a moment at the end to visit with those tables back there. They're all partners of ours. Uh, they've been very helpful in setting this uh, community forum up. Um, we have uh, the Contact Rape Crisis Center, the Branches Domestic Violence Program, the West Virginia Human Rights Commission, the Huntington uh, Human Relations Commission, and also my office. So they have some good resources available back on those tables. Um, be sure you visit. That will help, help you get the information. They might have some information you can take and share with your uh, friends, family, members of your community in case they would want that information. Uh, the way the program's going to work today is we're going to spend the first half of it doing a little bit of education. Uh, in just a moment, two assistant United States attorneys from my office are going to come up and give a presentation. Uh, it's called a United Against Hate presentation. This is the United Against Hate is not something just from my office. It's nationwide. They're going to explain how some of that works. They're going to explain federal hate crime laws, uh, things of that nature. Uh, that presentation uh, should last about 30, 35 minutes. And then uh, we have Peyton Smith, who's the uh, cap with the Cabell County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, and she's going to come up and educate us on the West Virginia state hate crimes and how they can be prosecuted and um, how people should share that information. And after that, that's when we start the forum. That's what I'm really excited about, what I'm looking forward to see. I hope we get take your time, write some good questions out uh, so we can let uh, the forum members answer. With that being said, I would in like to introduce my Deputy Criminal Chief, Monica Coleman and my, an assistant United States attorney, Jason Bailey, who are going to give us the United Against Hate presentation. Good evening. I'm AUSA Jason Bailey. Um, I work in our Office of Civil Division in Charleston, uh, but part of my job involves uh, enforcing our nation's civil rights laws, uh, including those that prohibit unlawful discrimination. It's no secret that hate crimes divide communities. They create fear in communities. This evening is an opportunity for everyone to learn a little bit more about hate crimes and the resources available here in this community, as well as those available federally. Engaging with these support systems can help prevent hate crimes and play a role in uniting the community should an incident occur. We've all seen too often how individuals filled with hate have unleashed horrific violence. Within the last couple of years, we've witnessed the terrible attacks at the Topps Market in Buffalo, on Club Q in Colorado Springs, uh, at a Dollar General in Jacksonville, and the list goes on. There have also been, been numerous other incidents that have not garnered international media, but have affected their communities all the same. Strong community police relationships are critical to tackling these crimes. Uh, we encourage you to introduce yourself to some of our law enforcement partners that are here today. I see some scattered around the room, uh, or any of our panelists after the event. But we hope this presentation helps you better identify and report potential hate crimes and incidents so we can work together to prevent future incidents from occurring and bringing perpetrators to justice. 
We will start in part one by providing an overview of hate crimes and incidents and help you identify them if and when they occur. Uh, in part two, uh, we'll discuss the importance of reporting hate crimes and incidents to law enforcement so they can respond appropriately. And lastly, in part three, we'll discuss strategies for responding to and preventing hate crimes, which includes strengthening relationships between communities and law enforcement and building coalitions with other community groups. We'll also highlight some local and federal resources that may be useful to you. The most important thing about today's event, uh, which has already been alluded to, is what happens once we all leave this room. Hopefully this presentation will encourage you uh, to stay in contact with our U.S. Attorney's Office and to ask about resources or training materials that the Justice Department has to offer uh, that might help this community troubleshoot a situation uh, or work to prevent one from occurring. We know that talking about hate crimes can be a very difficult thing to do. Um, these incidents bring up strong emotions, so there's just a few ground rules that we want to set before we, set before we get going. Uh, we want to encourage an open and honest dialogue, and to maximize our, our time together, let's remember to treat everyone with respect. And this goes for this presentation, for the forum that comes uh, in a little bit. We're going to make this a judgment-free zone. Uh, opinions are not right or wrong, they just are. Facts are right and wrong. If your opinion differs from someone else's and you want to express your disagreement with them, uh, we ask that you do so respectfully. And we want everyone to feel comfortable sharing without worrying about certain comments being attributed to them. So while we encourage you to go out after this and share uh, what you saw and what you learned tonight, uh, we ask that you don't attribute any specific comments uh, to certain organizations or certain individuals. Of course, we ask that you silence your cell phones um, and because we do have a limited time for this presentation, uh, we'll ask that you hold questions until the end. And if we do have some time left over at the end, uh, we're happy to answer any questions we have, um, any questions you have. And if you want to talk to someone in a confidential manner, uh, there will be members from the U.S. Attorney's Office, law enforcement here after the event uh, that you can talk to. So just to get to know a little better about who we have in the room and why we're here, I'm gonna read and display a few statements and ask you just to raise your hand if it, if it uh, pertains to you. Uh, do we have anyone here who works or volunteers for a community organization or NGO? Okay, good. Anybody who works in law enforcement either currently uh, or in the past? Uh, anybody who works for federal, state, or local governmental entities that are not law enforcement? Okay. Anybody who works for an educational institution? Okay, I see some hands. Um, and finally, anybody who knows someone who's been affected by a hate crime or incident? Okay, so looking around this room, you can see hate crimes and incidents have already affected those who are with us. So we're going to start by talking about hate crimes and hate incidents and how hate crimes are different from hate incidents. So in general, a hate crime is a criminal offense. Uh, we're talking murder, assault, arson, vandalism, or threats made toward someone um, that is motivated by someone's hate toward a group of people or a class of people that are protected by law. So the term hate can be a little misleading. Uh, while individuals who commit hate crimes often do hate everyone who has the characteristic of the targeted victim, most laws require only that the crime was committed because of those characteristics. Federal hate crime laws cover certain crimes because of these classes. Uh, they protect those based on uh, race, color, national origin, religion, disability, sexual orientation, familial status, sex, gender, and gender identity. And other federal laws protect these same exact groups from discrimination, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. Hate crimes are, hate crimes are not new in the United States, and nev neither are the laws that uh, prohibit them. Over the last 50 years, Congress has passed additional laws uh, expanding the areas in which individuals are protected, as well as what classes of individuals are protected. Most states and U.S. territories have hate crime statutes as well. 
um, that are enforced by state and local law enforcement in state and local courts. Hate crime laws in states and territories vary widely uh, across jurisdictions, so luckily we have someone here who's going to talk after this about West Virginia's hate crime statute. Um, but as a spoiler, it does differ a little bit from the federal hate crime law. Uh, it does not protect individuals because of their disability, uh, because of their familial status, because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Um, and you know, we talk about all these differences in the laws, but do you need to really absorb all these minute details uh, about the complicated patchwork between federal and state hate crime laws? Absolutely not. Uh, we just want you to know that even if a hate incident is not covered by state law, as you may hear in a little bit that it's not, it should still be reported to local and federal law enforcement. Some of you may wonder why we need hate crime laws, and some people do, when the underlying crimes themselves are illegal. But hate crime prosecutions matter in a different way. The impact of hate crimes is felt beyond the immediate victim of the crime and that person's family. Hate crimes also traumatize others who share the traits of the victim, as well as the victim's community and sometimes the entire nation. People who commit hate crimes often intend to frighten all members of the community who share the targeted trait. And they can come with a chilling message. Get out of here or you'll be next. Following a hate crime, victims, members of that group, and their greater community may feel afraid when carrying out normal daily functions, whether it's at home, work, school, uh, local businesses, places of worship. They don't feel safe to go about their daily lives. And attacks motivated by bias tend to be more violent than other attacks. Perpetrators perpetrators of hate crimes are likely to commit them again. So prioritizing hate crimes gets dangerous offenders off the street. It also sends a message to the targeted groups that they are valued members of our community, valued members of society, and their protection matters to us. Have you ever wondered why someone was not arrested for spewing hate-filled uh, and hurtful messages? Why isn't hate speech illegal, you might have asked? Well, under the First Amendment of the Constitution, people have the right to express themselves, even if their message is one of hate. But even with the First Amendment, there are limits to free speech, particularly when that speech is advocating or threatening violence or encouraging people to commit crimes. Then, depending on the circumstances, it may be considered a hate crime. True threats, meaning statements where the speaker means to communicate a serious expression of an intent to commit an act of unlawful violence to particular individuals, are outside the bounds of protected speech. Regardless of whether the concerning conduct is protected speech or a hate crime because of a direct threat that was made, we always encourage you to report all such incidents to law enforcement because it may alert authorities to an ongoing threat or help with the investigation of a later hate crime. We want to share with you, especially the parents in the room, uh, that certain hate organizations seek to recruit teenagers through online forums and chat rooms, uh, online games, social networking. Uh, if you notice that your child or someone else has begun viewing internet sites and materials that contain hateful content, use hate-related symbols, or they're spending time with friends who do, uh, please don't disregard it. Uh, it may be a warning sign and present an opportunity for you to intervene and redirect their energies. Communities naturally tend to trust law enforcement more when they see police acting on complaints that are made. But not all hate-motivated conduct can be prosecuted as a hate crime. Law enforcement may fully investigate a complaint made by someone but find that certain requirements could not be met. As I just talked about, People have a First Amendment right to express themselves, even messages of hate. Not every insult or slur is a hate crime. That type of hateful conduct is what we call a hate incident. But again, just because law enforcement can't prosecute something as a hate crime doesn't mean that nothing can be done. Now we have a time for a couple of examples to demonstrate uh, some, some nuances between the difference of a hate crime and a hate incident. So I'm going to read the scenario and ask you all to raise your hands about whether you think it's a hate crime or a hate incident. So the scenario is a group of protesters stand outside an event hosted here by Huntington Pride. As attendees exit the event, the protesters taunt them, calling them homophobic, derogatory names. Uh, how many of you in this room think that that's a hate crime in and of itself? 
anybody. Don't be shy. I'm not going to call anybody out. How about a hate incident? Okay, a lot more hands there. Yeah, so the taunting and derogatory name calling here were hateful acts, absolutely, but no crime took place. Not a hate crime, it's a hate incident. Now let's add the fact that a man swung a crowbar at the attendees while calling them these same names. Who thinks that would change anything? Okay, a lot of hands again. And exactly, swinging a crowbar at someone constitutes assault. And when the assault is motivated by someone's perceived sexual orientation or gender identity, uh, it may constitute a hate crime under federal law. Uh, lastly, should this still be reported to law enforcement even though it's just a hate incident? How many think it should, should be reported still? Okay. Anybody think it's not necessary to report this one? Okay, good. Um, you know, please report to law enforcement, as I've already emphasized, any hate crimes or hate incidents you experience or observe, um, because even if it's not enough evidence to prosecute the offender, uh, it can always help the police detect patterns uh, or solve other potential crimes. And one more. The scenario here is a 20-year-old Muslim woman from Pakistan wearing a hijab attends Marshall University. She returns to her dorm room to see a note stuck to her door that says, your people don't belong here. How many think this constitutes a hate crime? A hate incident? Okay, this, this is another example of a hate incident. It obviously reflects a hateful uh, or biased act. Could be based on either the woman's religion or her national origin. Uh, but no direct threat was made. Uh, no crime, there's no property damage, no underlying crime to this one. Now, I'm going to add the fact that she returns to her dorm room to see a note stuck to her door with hateful anti-Muslim language threatening her life. How many thinks that would change the situation? Okay, good. So perhaps uh, because issuing a threat to someone's life appears credible, real, imminent, that would be a crime. That threat would appear to be motivated uh, by the individual's religion, possibly her national origin, uh, so it could be a potential hate crime. And how many thinks this should still be reported regardless of that additional fact that was added? Good, you're catching along, good, all right. Some hate incidents like bullying and harassment in K through 12 schools and certain mistreatment in housing and public accommodations like hotels and restaurants may be discrimination under federal laws. These laws are civil laws, they're not criminal laws, so people who violate them don't go to jail, uh, but we can investigate and we can seek remedies in these types of situations, like back pay, damages, we can seek court orders requiring training uh, and the prevention of future violations. Although the federal government doesn't always have the authority to take action in response to instances of discrimination, there may be other remedies available uh, through state or local government or private action. If we had more time in this presentation, we'd go through some of these laws that prohibit uh, discrimination and provide some examples on how these federal statutes can be implicated. Uh, but in inter interests of time, we're gonna focus here on hate crimes and hate incidents. But instances of discrimination are important still to identify and report, especially to our office, because they can easily escalate to a hate crime uh, or a hate incident if they're not addressed early on. Again, these are things that are repeated. They don't just happen once and stop most often. Even when a hate incident cannot be prosecuted, information about the event, as I've said earlier, is still useful to law enforcement. Uh, again, this is the common theme of the evening. It helps police understand more about trends in a community. It may help officers investigate future hate crimes. Reporting to the police also helps bring awareness to the problem. We all know that it can be confusing to distinguish between a hate crime, a hate incident, and discrimination. What we want you to remember is to report any incidents that you're aware of to law enforcement so they can determine what to do with the information. Now I asked earlier uh, whether anyone here knew of someone including themselves who had been affected by a hate crime and hate incident, and we saw a lot of hands go up. Uh, is there anyone who didn't raise their hand earlier who now realizes that they do know someone who was affected by a hate incident that maybe should have been reported? Okay, very well. I'm now going to turn the presentation over uh, to a fellow AUSA and Deputy Criminal Chief, Monica Coleman. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Um, 
We're going to talk about now that you have a better understanding of how to identify a hate crime, about what you should do when one occurs. So let's say that you've experienced a hate crime, you've watched a hate crime occur, or someone has come to you and or to your organization and shared their experience as a hate crime victim. What should you do? The first thing to do is to immediately call 911. In addition to getting emergency assistance, if it's a hate crime that's occurring at that moment, this also allows you to report the crime to your local authority. After everyone's safe, if it's an occurring crime, or if it's a crime that's already occurred, we encourage you to call your local FBI field office to report the crime so that they can work with local law enforcement to investigate if any federal hate crime laws were violated. You can do this by submitting a tip online at the website there or calling your local FBI field office. Reporting hate crimes is critical because it can help the police stop dangerous people before they harm anyone else. Reporting can also alert police to hate issues affecting the community, which they may not have been aware of. Reporting provides police with the opportunity to dev devote additional resources to prevent further harm. When reporting a hate crime or incident, there is important information that you should share. You need to provide law enforcement as much detail as you can to help them investigate, including, and specifically, all hateful language. Some of the most helpful types of information are listed on this slide. And they include whether the victim is a member of a protected class, of which the perpetrator is not a member, comments, written statements, or gestures made by the perpetrator, drawings, marks, symbols, or graffiti near where the hate crime happened, the perpetrator's membership in an organized hate groups or informal hate groups, previous hate crimes or incidents committed near the same place, location, such as a religious site, or a place of significance to people in a protected class, and the victim witness's perception of the crime and the motive of the offender, if it's known. Reporting these factors to law enforcement can help make the, invest the difference in whether the incident is properly identified and investigated as a hate crime. So also, we want you to please encourage the victims of the hate crimes to seek support services like counseling to cope with the crime. The Department of Justice offers victims and their community services. The DOJ's Community Relations Service has tools to help communities peacefully resolve conflicts. For communities experience conflict, experiencing conflict, the Community Relations Service facilitates communication while developing communities' abilities to independently prevent and resolve conflicts. The CRS serves as a neutral third party, and its services are confidential, voluntary, and free. There's also the Office of Crime Vict Victims of Crime, which funds state victims' assistance programs and a national hotline for all crime victims, not just those of uh, hate, and that's Crime Con or Victims Connect. We'll talk about additional resources from the state and local government a little later in the program. In addition to reporting hate crimes to law enforcement, we want to know if you believe your civil rights or someone else's civil rights have been violated. So please contact us at the U.S. Attorney's Office and or the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division, which can be reached through their reporting portal, and that information is on that slide. Reporting hate crimes to law enforcement can make the FBI's annual hate crime statistics report more accurate. The FBI statistics come from law enforcement agencies all over the country who voluntarily send their data to the FBI. 
The 2022 statistics were released in October of 2023. Police department used crime statistics to determine priorities and allocate funding for different initiatives. The more accurate their data, the better they will be able to address concerns in your community. This chart shows that there were 11,288 hate crimes reported to the FBI in 2022 and shows the demographic breakdown of who was targeted by those single bias hate crimes. So you may be looking at this chart and thinking that 11,288 hate crimes sounds really low compared to the population of the United States, which is over 300 million. And you would be right. There is a significant problem with underreporting. Of the 18,884 state, county, city, university and college, and tribal agencies eligible to participate in the Uniform Criminal Crime Reporting Program, only 14,631 of those agencies submitted data in 2022. The most common location for reported hate crimes from 2018 through 2022 was at someone's residence or home. It's almost 30% of the, of the reported hate crimes occurred in someone's home. Followed by the highways, roadways, alleys, and the third most reported area was at schools. With reported crimes at school occurring over twice as often at an elementary or secondary school than a college or university. So let's talk about some of the local hate crime statistics in West Virginia. These statistics may not represent reality in West Virginia because again, they were based on crimes reported uh, to law enforcement who in turn report them to the FBI. But you can see that in West Virginia, of the hate crimes reported, 42.6% were based off of race, ethnicity, or ancestry, and 33.3% were religion, 167 were sexual orientation, gender identity represents 3.7, disability 3.7, and there were 0% reported with respect to gender. Data from a survey of the general population on victimization collected by the Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Statistics tells us even more about the problem of underreporting of hate crimes. The first three bars represent numbers from the National Crime Victimization Survey, uh, while the last represent police data from the Uniform Crime Reports. That's what's reported to the FBI based on law enforcement agency reports and classification. Based on the survey results, you can see that on average, over 200,000 individuals in the United States reported experiencing hate crimes each year, but only half report these events to the police. So why are people reporting hate crimes to the police? The most common reason for not reporting given by victims who did not report to the police was that the victimization was handled another way. That's 38%, such as privately or through a non-law enforcement official. The second reason given, about one quarter, 23%, believed that police could not or would not do anything to help. The Department of Justice is working to address the issues from all angles including providing additional training and resources to law enforcement to improve hate crime investigations and reporting. We also have to do more to improve community policing relationships and continue to build trust between the community and law enforcement. So now we're gonna talk about federal and local law enforcement and community organizations um, how they hold the people who commit hate crimes accountable, support victims, and work together to prevent hate crimes from occurring. As mentioned in the beginning, responding to hate crimes requires a multidisciplinary approach 
and lots of cooperation between the investigators and the prosecutors, as well as between local and federal law enforcement. We want to make a mo take a moment to clarify our different roles and how we work together. Local law enforcement are police officers here in your community, and they are your first point of contact for any crime, including a hate crime. They identify whether a crime is potentially motivated by hate, investigate possible hate incidents by collecting evidence and interviewing suspects, provide support and assistance to hate crime victims by directing victims to emergency financial assistance and other emergency care is needed, and connecting victims with victims assistance professionals who can provide counseling and support. They also build and sustain good community relationships through the use of police community liaisons, community policing, and general support to the community. They also document hate crimes and prepare statistical reports for the FBI. As you will hear after our presentation, the county prosecuting attorney's office decides whether to charge someone with a state hate crime or in West Virginia seek a sentence enhancement based on the information discovered during the police investigation. Federal law enforcement. The FBI plays a role similar to that of local law enforcement. The difference is the FBI investig investigates whether a federal hate crime has occurred. They also provide support and help train state and local law enforcement agencies, and they conduct outreach to the public. The FBI recently launched the National Anti-Hate Crimes Campaign to raise, aware to raise awareness of the FBI's role in investigating hate crimes and encouraging people who, who may have witnessed a hate crime or been a victim of a hate crime to report to the FBI. Together, the Civil Rights Division and the U.S. Attorney's Offices prosecute federal hate crimes and hold offenders accountable. There are 94 United States Attorney's Offices like ours nationwide. We each serve as the chief um, law, federal law enforcement officer in our district. Each U.S. Attorney's Office has a victim service unit that provides assistance to victims in the cases it prosecutes. The Civil Rights Division enforces a wi wide range of federal civil rights laws and has prosecuted hundreds of hate crime cases around the country. They work with the U.S. Attorney's Offices in each district around the country to prosecute those cases. Jason and I serve as contacts for our U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of West Virginia and can help make sure a civil rights complaint is routed to the correct location if better handled by another federal agency. As you know, many victims of hate crimes and other vulnerable individuals may not feel comfortable working with and reporting hate crimes and incidents to law enforcement. So here are a couple of additional websites with search tools to help you find local resources. There's the DOJ's Victim Connect Resource Center, which operates a hotline and provides confidential referrals for crime victims. The center is available to all crime victims and is not specialized to hate crimes, but it does have a page dedicated to hate crimes and hate crime resources. Another resource is the Stop Hate Project, run by the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under the law. This project provides referrals and links to organizations that can provide victims support for reporting hate crimes, legal advice, local resources, and even guidance on assessing financial resources. Locally, there are several resources to help victims of crime, including hate crimes, and a few of those local organizations are listed on this, site, this slide. Some of the trainings the Department of Justice offers includes bias incidents and hate crime forums. These are public events the Community Relations Service, or CRS, conduct to provide community members public officials, and other interested parties with the chance to network with subject matter experts, improve understanding of hate crime laws, form a working group to address hate crimes, and identify resources, programs, 
and tools to help prevent and respond to bias incidents and hate crime. Community dialogues, these are CS CRS sponsored forums that draw participants from many parts of the community as possible to an exchange information face to face, share personal stories and experiences, honestly ex express perspectives, clarify viewpoints, and develop solutions to community concerns. The Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Crime Act training. These include information on the background and history of hate crime prosecutions of racially suspicious violent crimes that were committed during the pre-civil rights era that have been reopened under the act. There's protecting places of worship forums. These are CRS sponsored forums that bring together law enforcement, security officials, interfaith leaders, civil rights groups, and community members to educate faith communities on religious-based hate crimes, ways to increase the physical security of religious buildings, and how to respond to active shooter situations. Then there's the engaging and building partnerships. These are in-person trainings designed to increase community awareness, create action plans, and build relationships between law enforcement, government officials, and specific marginalized communities. You can find out more about these programs and other work the Department of Justice is doing to address hate crimes on our website, which is www.justice.gov backslash hate crime. Everyone has a role to play in combating hate crimes. In addition to work local and national leaders must undertake to tackle this problem, local communities also play a vital role. By being here today, and by hopefully spreading what, you're, what you've learned to others, each of you is helping to develop awareness about how diversity is a strength, and that hate will not be tolerated in your community. You're helping to build relationships and partnerships with your local law enforcement agencies to help them become aware of potential hate-related problems before a crime occurs. The more you can continue to build bridges between and among multi multiple community organizations, schools, businesses, and churches, the better, since isolated groups are much more vulnerable and susceptible to hate crime. Today, you are continuing to open an open dialogue, or I'm sorry, you are contributing to an open dialogue and can continue to provide opportunities for open communication both informally and formally through holding dialogues, forums, training, et cetera, in your own community. And last but not least, you can help spread the word about hate crimes and what they are and how to respond if or when one occurs in your community. We hope today's program is the beginning of an ongoing relationship. We are here and ready to respond and work with you and your organizations to combat hate crime. Please report hate crimes and incidents to police, FBI, and to us at the U.S. Attorney's Office. Remember, even if a crime is not prosecuted, reporting is still important and serves an important role. It gathers potential evidence for future hate crimes. It supports law enforcement to build awareness of hate incidents in the community and it allows them to know where they need to allocate their resources, and it empowers victims to know they can and should take action. We here at the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Civil Rights Division, and local community advocacy groups may also be able to help you pursue a civil discrimination claim to address your injury. So that is also something we want you to reach out to us about. We want to help connect victims of hate crimes and hate incidents with the resources that you've learned about today and build strong relationships with your local law enforcement and other community groups. We have a few question, minutes for questions before our time is up if anybody has any.
Well, it it is important to to vote to to contact both because the local they they have different jurisdictions. The federal only has jurisdiction if a federal hate crime has occurred. The local is also going to be your quicker response, and it also allows the local law enforcement to know where it is they may need to up their presence. They may need to allocate their resources if it's reported locally. They do. We have a very good work working relationship with our local law enforcement partners. They oftentimes reach out to or regularly reach out, and we get a lot of referrals that way. But I would still encourage you to report to both because that way you know it's getting reported. The both should be reported to your local law enforcement and to the FBI. Any other questions? All right. I'd now like to invite Peyton Smith. Uh, she's Cabell County's Chief Deputy Prosecuting Attorney, and she's going to talk to us about the state hate crime laws and what we can do to prosecute them, how we report them, and how her office handles them. Hi there. Um, as Mr. Thompson said, my name is Peyton Smith. I work for the Cabell County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. I'm one of our two chief deputies. I'm the one who works primarily with our law enforcement officers in the county. So part of what I'll be talking about is training and things that we hope to improve moving forward regarding hate crimes. But first, in West Virginia, as it was previously mentioned, our hate crime statute is slightly different from that of the federal level. It targets crimes um, using force or the threat of force against person or property uh, based on certain protected classes. So first being race, color, religion, ancestry, national origin, political affiliation, and sex. So you will notice that there's no gender identity, there's no sexual orientation, and there is no disability classes that are listed in our statute. In 2017, we actually had a case go up from Cabell County to the West Virginia Supreme Court that focused on the fact that sexual orientation is not a protected class in West Virginia. So in 2015, a man was riding with a group of friends down the street, stopped at a stoplight, and he saw two men on the sidewalk exchanging a kiss. He started to make homophobic slurs towards those two men, got out of the car, went up to the two men, and proceeded to strike both of them. He was charged with battery for striking both of them, but he was also indicted on the felony offense in West Virginia, which is the hate crime statute. So it's violating the civil rights of another based on one of those protected classes. Unfortunately, as we said, West Virginia doesn't protect sexual orientation as one of those protected classes, so when the case went up to the West Virginia Supreme Court, they agreed with the local judge that had said that, unfortunately, we could not prosecute that man at the state level for targeting somebody based on sexual orientation. There have been repeated attempts in our legislature to add that as a protected class, um, and I believe there was just recently another bill that's being introduced seeking to add that as a protected class at the state level. For now, the feds still consider that a protected class. So until West Virginia has added that, um, the Cabell County Prosecuting Attorney's Office and our local law enforcement officers have great working relationships with the feds. So if anything is reported that does not fall into one of the classes that West Virginia protects, then we do have that relationship with federal law enforcement and federal prosecutors who will be able to actually prosecute those crimes that we cannot. Um, 
So as I said, and as they said previously, the main differences between our law and the federal law are those protected classes that West Virginia does not list in our statute. Um, but it is still important whether we protect that class or not to report it to local law enforcement. We can't expect our hardworking law enforcement officers to do anything to help the people of this community if this information is not brought to their attention. So as it was previously passed on, we do ask that you report that to both the state level and the federal level. But we would like you to start with um, the state level because it is the local law enforcement officers that are dealing with members of our community on a daily basis. They can't report it to the FBI for local crime statistics if they are not aware of it. And hate crimes, like many other crimes, are largely underreported, as you could see in a lot of the slides. Um, in the six different categories that one of the slides listed of hate crimes in West Virginia, where it said gender, there were none. Obviously, there have been hate crimes involving gender. They just are not reported. And of the five that did have reported incidents, three of them are not covered as protected classes in West Virginia. So again, that stresses the importance of the state and federal levels working together and exchanging information. But we want to stress again reporting everything. Um, in 1992, there was an African-American family that moved into a West Virginia community that was largely populated by white families. Um, a few weeks after they moved there, there were notes that started appearing on their vehicle telling them that needed, they needed to move or something was going to be done. They called local law enforcement. Local law enforcement did not know how to respond to notes being left on the car. So they took a report, but no law enforcement officer responded to the scene. They just made a note of it. A few weeks later, the back tires of that family's vehicle had been slashed. Again, the family called law enforcement. A sheriff's deputy was sent out to the scene, took a report, but again, was largely unaware, especially at that time, what the appropriate response was for that kind of incident. And a few weeks after that, the family came home to find a bullet hole in their window. So this stresses the importance of reporting everything, even if something may not be a crime, leaving a note on somebody's vehicle. If that isn't reported, then the later incidents that happen don't have the same context. So we need to know about each and every incident so that we can have local law enforcement presence in the neighborhood so that things can be tracked. We need to be able to report those stats to the FBI so that they're aware of an actual accurate representation of what is going on in our local community. We want to focus on training with our local law enforcement officers so that they do know how to recognize hate crimes and hate incidents and so that they know the appropriate way to respond. So they know about sending officers to the scene, taking reports, and what to do with the information that they get. It provides context to later incidents, and it also helps us track suspects and individuals that may be witnesses to other crimes by knowing about previous occurrences. In the prosecutor's office, we do work with local law enforcement as far as providing training. We also stress the importance of our own prosecutors receiving training so that we know how to recognize hate crimes and we know how to properly prosecute them. Um, in West Virginia, our hate crime statute is a felony. So like the case that I talked about in 2015 that went up to the Supreme Court in 2017, that particular case, he was charged with two counts of battery, which is a misdemeanor. Um, misdemeanors, the maximum they can carry is up to a year in jail. A lot of times they result in nothing but a fine. But in that particular case, the two additional charges that couldn't be prosecuted at that time were they carry up to a penalty of 10 years. So in West Virginia, while we do have less protected classes, we do take hate crimes extremely seriously. They have very steep penalties. And even if somebody is not being prosecuted 
under that hate crime statute. If there's any instance of hate involved in a crime, we can use that as a sentencing enhancement. We can make that case to the judge. The judge can take that into account as far as if they want to allow for alternative sentencing, whether that's probation or home confinement, or if due to the instance of hate in a particular crime or occurrence, then they can choose to send somebody to prison. So that stresses, again, the importance of reporting anything that you see, anything that you yourself experience, because we need to have all the information that we can moving forward so that we can address any issues in our local community that involve hate and hate crimes. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And like Ian, I want to stress the relationship we have with Cabell County Prosecutor's Office, Huntington Police Department, Cabell County Sheriff's Office, our local law enforcement here, as well as we have federal partners here as well. Um, and that's part of the purpose of this tonight is building upon those relationships. Uh, next, this is the part I think everybody came for, and I would like to two things. Number one, ask our members of the forum to come up here and join me now. And I would also ask, I've got some people from my office that's going to help collect. Anybody who written out, wrote out questions, if you could, they'll come around and they'll bring them up and then we'll start trying to get the questions answered. Be a seat wherever you want to. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm going to introduce the members of the forum. Um, First, we have Angela Adams. Angela is the President and CEO of Mountain State Centers for Independent Living and Foundation of Independent Living. Uh, has offices in Huntington and Beckley, West Virginia. Serves 19 counties with various service programs. The centers are community-based, non-residential, non-profit agency that provides an array of independent living services to individuals with disabilities. I'd next like to introduce uh, Sue Barazzi. She is the president of the West Virginia Interfaith Refugee Ministry and vice president of the Islamic Association of West Virginia. She works as a humanitarian civil rights activist after her retirement from the U.S. Department of Labor, where she served as an assistant area director for OSHA for 29 years. She's very dedicated to serving the community, working with the interfaith community to spread peace and understanding and promoting awareness and education to eliminate the misconceptions about immigrants, especially Muslims. I'd next like to introduce Hoyt Glazier. Uh, he was born in Virginia, raised in West Virginia. Uh, upon graduation from law school, he returned to West Virginia, worked for the West Virginia Supreme Court. He's practiced law with several law firms and handled a variety of matters. Uh, since 2015, he's been working here in Huntington and has been a member of Glazer, Saad, Anderson, and appeared several times for the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. He is here today as president of the Temple of B'nai Shalom. Next, I'd like to introduce Allie Lehman. Uh, she's a founding member and president of Huntington Pride. She serves on Mayor Williams' Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee and the LBTGQIA Plus Advisory Committee. She's also a commissioner on the Huntington Human Relations Commissioner and is a City of Huntington Councilwoman. And finally, we have Charles C. Myers, Jr. Uh, he was born in Huntington, uh, where he currently resides. Um, received his Bachelor of Science in Engineering Civil Emphasis. I've got a civil engineering degree as well. Good deal. Uh, from Marshall University in 2013. Currently works at Geiger Brothers Incorporated, where he's a project manager for construction and design of commercial and federal projects. He's a member of the Antioch uh, Missionary Baptist Church, 
as, and was the immediate past president of the Huntington Cabell Branch of the NAACP, where his main focus continues to be able to represent Huntington, West Virginia in a positive manner. Uh, with that being said, do we have some questions gathered up? Okay, and I'm going to encourage you throughout the process, if there's a question that comes up, write it down, raise your hand, we'll have somebody come and collect that and bring it to us. We didn't want to do an open mic because sometimes people ask long questions and they tend to dominate, and we want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to be heard, and we answer as many questions as possible. All right, uh, first question I have is... Uh, to which level of law enforcement should hate incidents be reported? Is it necessary to contact both local and federal levels in every instance, or do they share information? And what is the familial status protected class? Good question. I think I know where this question came from. <laughs> um, I don't know if any members of the forum have anything they wish to say on that. I think it probably is sort of directed. It's basically family relationships, um, gay marriage, things of that nature. Okay. I think we did a pretty good job of answering your question earlier, but report it to both uh, for the fact we do have good um, relationships with everyone, uh, but it's always good to make sure everybody hears it. Okay. All right, I think this is a good one for um, the panel. Have any groups or safe spaces been created in Huntington or the tri-state area? Somewhere that people can go, sit in a circle, share experiences, and support uh, from other individuals that suffer through similar trauma. I'm going to encourage the panel to answer that. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Sorry. Hi. Um, my name is Allie. My pronouns are she, her. Um, as an um, active member within the LGBTQIA plus community, um, member and president of Huntington Pride, uh, we do our best to create events throughout Huntington um, for our LGBTQ community. Um, we do espresso yourself coffee events where people can just come and have coffee and meet um, folks within the community. Um, we're doing a unity walk on Trans Day of Visibility, March 30th, that everybody is welcome to come and participate in. And we're very thankful for Mayor Williams to be able to participate um, on the 30th. Um, we do a Pride event um, in June and October. Um, and our pride organization with a local artist, Sasa Wilkes, we're going to start um, kind of therapeutic art events. It's called the Healing Kaleidoscope, and they'll be the last Thursday of every month for folks within the community to come and create um, art. Um, not only that, but our city, I think, has come a long way. We have the Open to All campaign. Um, we have almost 300 local businesses um, throughout the city of Huntington, you can see a sticker that says open to all on the businesses, um, which I think create safe places. I know when my wife and I were planning our wedding, um, we looked to the open to all campaign to where we were going to get uh, vendors to use um, that we weren't going to get turned away um, or be discriminated against. Um, also, we are very thankful for our partners like Branches Domestic Violence Shelter. We have a LGBTQIA plus health and safety resource guide that's hosted on their website that has different health and safety resources for the LGBTQ community. I can keep talking, but I will stop and let somebody else talk. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Hoyt Glazer. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, picking up on what Allie said, it, it would be ideal if the whole city of Huntington the whole state of West Virginia, the whole United States could be a safe space, right? 
we shouldn't have to worry about where we go and whether we're going to be welcomed or respected or treated with dignity. And um, this meeting today, I think, is a big part of that. I think the idea is to expand so that we don't have to worry about uh, hate crimes. That's ideal. But um, speaking for myself, um, I'm Jewish, and I know that my guest safe space is I go to my temple, and that's where I know I can express myself freely. Um, you know, it's Huntington's great, honestly. I know that we do have our issues, but, uh, you know, my daughter is in New York City, totally different. I mean, she's afraid to express her Judaism up there. But here, you know, if I wear, want to wear a yarmulke or something, I can do that. So that's something to be said, and I appreciate the city's efforts here, and uh, I'm very proud of our city. Um, so one of the uh, initiatives um, that I've put together in the past, which is going to um, continue on um, starting this summer, um, is called the American Dream Movement um, for uh, students, um, African American male students, you know, sixth grade and up. Um, that will allow them to be able to be in an environment um, with individuals, you know, black males, as well as just any individual who, you know, inspires to, or aspires to encourage them, as well as um, be able to hear them out, be able to relate to them, be able to understand where they're coming from and what, you know, steps um, they can take kind of going forward. So I pride myself in, on that, you know, essentially being a safe space from the, from the aspect of you know, the individuals who were within that group from four, uh, 2014 to 2019 have approached me to um, start that back up again. And this time around, they're going to be the ones who are going to be taking lead. And that's very inspiring to be able to know that you know, uh, an initiative kind of brought on its life of its own as to, you know, the 16 um, boys turned into men and, you know, the, you know, a group of those men want to, you know, take those next steps, you know, forward to lead the charge, you know, going forward. And, um, you know, I think that's what, when you create a, you know, safe space, you want it to be something that can be continuous, that can kind of out, outlive, you know, your time in that moment. It's not working, now it's better. Again, assalamu alaikum, peace and blessing be upon you. I am Sue Barazi, the Vice President, Islamic Association, West Virginia. So I'm gonna talk about what we do in Charleston, but Huntington Masjid or mosque is really just as active. What we try to do from time to time at the masjid is invite people. Like we create an event, get to know your neighbor, or history about Palestine, or uh, interfaith iftar or hijab day, so we can uh, uh, you know, answer the people question, why do women have to wear hijab? And so we try to invite people to come and have that conversation and come to get to know your neighbor. Another thing we do is we try uh, to participate in the community. We live in the community, so we are part of the community. We have a food pantry program that we feed, uh, fill the food pantry in two churches on the west side every month. Now it's been going on for six months. We serve Thanksgiving dinner, we serve uh, Christmas dinner. Uh, we participate in different events now. We form the team for the Breast Health Initiative. That's gonna take effect uh, on May the 4th. It's gonna take a place on May the 4th and we have 13 uh, people signed up to be part of that team, Race for the Ribbon. I'm a breast cancer survivor. We have, there is no family that has not been touched by breast cancer. So we need to encourage women specifically, and my daughter is a mammographer, the person who reads the mammogram for your breast. 
she's been finding more and more cases in young people. So I encourage men, and in men, by the way. I know somebody got scared and did this to me when I was talking to him. I said, don't worry. He said, don't we have enough? We have prostate cancer. I said, we don't want to be selfish. We want to give you something as well. So, you know. But we try our best to be part of the community. Our physician represents 60% almost of the health population here in Huntington as well. I think Mayor Williams know quite a few of them. Uh, we have a lot of young ladies in schools who are wearing hijab. And of course, sometimes they get harassed. So we try to get them more active, more participating. This is one day, a lot of times when we do hijab day, we do it at the schools like Charleston uh, High School, Charleston Catholic, and so on. And so we try to get the community involved and let get to know us. Everybody look at us as weirdo. We're not terrorists, not all of us are. Very few, actually few of us are. And we're a uh, very peaceful community. We're part of the community, we're a highly contributing community. And I want to provide all the opportunity, anybody who has any question or anything that feels uncomfortable talking to me or anybody else for that matter. Just let's have a conversation. Let's break bread together. Let's have coffee together. Let's uh, uh, know, get to know each other. I mean, we're neighbors. We live in small community, but we live in a larger community. So we care about the entire community. That's what our faith teaches us. So yes, we do provide many opportunity for the exchange take place. Hello, my name's Angela Adams, and I am President and CEO of Mountain State Centers for Independent Living. And we assist um, individuals in Huntington, Cabell County, West, and uh, in Wayne County in West Virginia with disability and that's any service that they may need um, that presents a challenge to them for their disability. Um, I'd first like to just comment on West Virginia and Huntington specifically. Um, we live in a great community. If any of you all have ever um, you know, lived in another community or taken on another state, which I have, I've lived other, other places, you, you come to really appreciate the, um, the, the hometown feel that Huntington has. And it's a wonderful place to live. And West Virginia, specifically, is a beautiful, wonderful state. We, I don't think that we have the problems that other states have. I'm not saying that West Virginia is perfect, because it's not. But, but we certainly don't have the larger city problems sometimes when it comes to these issues and West Virginia is just a wonderful place to raise a family and, and has been for years. That being said, specifically what um, our organization does provide, one, two of our core services are peer support and advocacy. We have others but those are two that I just wanted to bring to light because anyone that has a disability that comes to us for services. Um, we offer peer support amongst other individuals that, that come to our center as well as advocacy. And we teach them advocacy to teach them what their, um, how to advocate for themselves with their disability. And um, when, when we are doing that, we're creating a a relationship between us and them and a trust. And so I believe that our center here in Huntington and in Beckley are safe spaces for the disability community because they they come to us for assistance and obviously if they ever were a victim of a hate crime at all or any kind of discrimination, which we have had, we are their advocate. We They come to us, that's, that's where they're going to come first for help, and we would most certainly uh, go to bat for them in whatever and report it um, as we as we get the information. So um, 
I know all families ha usually have someone in their family that has a disability, and you know I would encourage them to um, to come to our center uh, because we are a a beacon to help anyone with a disability with different services. I could go into all the services, but we're limited on time. <laughs> All right, our next question is a great question. Uh, I'm interested to see how the forum answers it. How can community members help any of the panel members, organizations with efforts to amplify their messages of acceptance and anti-hate? Well, I'd like to ask you if you happen to be walking in now store or the grocery store or anything and you see somebody who's looking at somebody like me with hateful looks in their eyes and acting really weird around you not you know be friendly approach uh, me or try to do something that I would feel support because trust me it happened to me and it happens to so many of us so many times that people see you and they just cringe or get scared. And specifically old people for some reason, they've been taught in their mind something specific and they see this piece of cloth and they just think that's it. They write you off as if you are not a human, but they, and just recently when woman was, as I am walking through the aisle, she saw me and she, backed up so fast that I thought she was going to have the buggy fall on her. I said, relax, don't move, I'll back off, because this is going to fall on you. You remember, I'm a safety officer, so I pay attention to this stuff. So just be friendly, just be kind, and if somebody, you see somebody following a woman or a young lady like me to their car, that's not going to look good, trust me. And it happens a lot. And if you have any question, talk to your mem friends, talk to your people at work, talk to somebody. We, and if you see something, like we have an open house at the masjid frequently. We do events, come. Come to Huntington Masjid, they're very nice people. We are too, and we feed well, by the way. So, and we've never bit anybody, so nobody has to get scared. But get to know the person, get to know your neighbor, get to know people who are looking different than you, and please don't participate in othering the other. When you see somebody behaving towards somebody else, whether it's a handicapped person, whether it's dark brown skin, whatever it is, don't join in that behavior. Be better than they are. Remember, we're all God creation and we are all a human. And believe me, you have so much concern right now in your brain, so do I. We have self, we have in our own life so much that we go through trials and tribulations, so we don't really need this added pressure. I had to think here. I'm gonna come out in the dark, let's see. Do I park here, do I park here? I have to be close because I don't know what if somebody follows me, what if somebody don't like the way I look and follows me. We're always on constant lookout, like who's gonna come after you? Whether you're driving on the highway. I quit driving on the highway by myself with hijab because I've been followed too many times by truckers who they think they have fun pretending they're gonna hit me or something or flip me over or something. So it happens, trust me, but under-reporting, yes, it is under-reported tremendously. Because I'm not just going to come and bother you every time. Look, something happens, a guy chased me out of Kroger, am I supposed to say? He's an idiot, okay? That's all I can say. But please don't join in othering other people. No matter what that person is, everybody deserves respect, dignity and to live their lives. And by the way, we all wanna eat. If you see me in the grocery store, I really get hungry too, you know. Don't chase me out. I guess I would start with, I believe that um, we're all taught certain things at home 
and whether you were lucky enough to grow up in a family that really uh, taught love and kindness to other people. Um, I was, and but not everyone is. And so when that does happen, I think that um, you know it's it's up to those of us who did grow up in a in a family that um, was felt love and maybe you grew up in church, you know, and 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 that was the foundation of your love, and um, that we we show that to everyone and to those who don't believe in, in love. Um, of course, if it's a it's a crime, that's that's one thing, you know. If it's a violent crime, but a lot of times, if it's just the spoken word, I think it's like all of our duties to shut it down and not um, allow the person that that voice of of being discriminatory to other people. So I think that it's all of our responsibilities to just shut that down as a community because we we don't want that for our community and we we don't want it in our lives the only way that we can do um, combat it is to not give it any legs um, I would say to show up um, people can talk a lot of things um, but people are welcome to any event or any location um, that is supported by any group. Um, I think showing up and being an ally to our entire community, um, representation truly matters. Um, I was just talking before, um, our pride organization received a ton of hateful comments over two weekends ago um, telling us to unalive, unalive ourselves, um, saying that we need to go be pushed off a cliff, um, that there's a special place for us um, to go. <laughs> um, and I think also saying positive things on social media, um, supporting a group, saying, hey, you're doing a great job, or I see you. Um, I know like Hoyt has come um, to several of our, of our events and helped with our name change clinic and our United Against our, or our um, United for Love event. Um, and just allies showing up. We can't do what we do in the community without our allies. Um, I would honestly love to see um, HPD come more often. Um, I know we have officers that come to protect us at events but also just coming and being visible, I think would be huge for our community to also um, feel comfortable in reporting since reporting is very underrepresented. Thank you, Allie. Add your voice, speak out. The uh, I think Edmund Burke said something along the lines of, for the only thing to allow evil to happen is for good people to do nothing. Silence, don't be silent. Now, I'm up here, I used to be shy at one time, it took me 50 years to get over it. I'm still working on it. I'm just not comfortable up here, but I fake it well. Here's the thing. Just add your voice. Let people know. Tell Allie. Tell me. Tell, tell the mayor. Tell the police. Tell somebody you trust. Tell a leader. You don't need to do it. You don't need to get up on stage, but you need to make your voice known because if you don't, we know what can happen because we've seen it. History repeats itself. Add your voice. So, um, when I think of, you know, I guess myself, when it comes to any, whether it be a initiative or idea or some type of, um, whether it be a volunteer um, activity or, or just some, something that pops into my head um, that, you know, I'm, in, I'm inspired to do, um, that I you know, am able to put my you know whole heart into you know to whether it be supporting or to you know igniting to catalyze you know some type of um, um, some type of element you know within somebody. Um, the the most noise that 
you know, from an impact standpoint. So from the, the most noise I've ever made was from truly listening to individuals. I, I feel that's when you listen to individuals' needs, when you understand where they're coming from, your impact um, will begin to speak volumes because ultimately whatever you do, even as the, if it's the smallest act of kindness, um, will have such a large effect because if, if you do something that's genuine, if you do something, be it the smallest thing possible, even if it's just treating someone with the just the baseline of dignity that that person deserves in life, that in itself can really ignite, can really just you know catalyze, be a catalyst for that individual to achieve great things. And so, so that's how I guess that's what I would encourage that there's really no act that's too small there's really i think everyone wants to do something great something big you know something you know that's just out there and it, and it really doesn't need to be that way you know the smallest things that i've ever done it, it feels like i'll do something very small and then all of a sudden you know i'm photographed and I'm on, you know, Facebook, you know, picking up trash or something. I'm like, all I was doing was just, you know, trying to help out, trying to do, you know, just, I had an hour of free time. I wanted to clean up, you know, it, it's little things like that. If you are really genuine with your actions, if you're genuine with your thoughts, you know, the great things that you do can really shine just from your pure, your purest intent. Thank you. Uh, I think the next question is more directed to our office. According to statistics, uh, who, commit hate, who commits hate crimes? Race, gender, age, area of the U.S., area of the state. The easy answer is everyone commits hate crime. Every uh, race, gender, age, area. Um, a lot of the defendants, though, do tend to be white males. I mean, we do see a lot of that. As far as actual areas of West Virginia, uh, we're fortunate that we don't see a lot of actual hate crimes, um, and there's not enough data yet to say that one particular area of the state is more significant than the other. Uh, my fear is is that there actually are a lot of hate crimes that are just not being reported. Uh, so that's one of the reasons we're doing this today, is to encourage people to report them so that we can then begin to understand if there are certain areas of the state, um, certain biographical information that would help us target. Uh, the more information we have, the more data we have, uh, the better we can respond to this. All right, uh, next questions for the panel. Uh, I'm curious to see this one. Realistically, what may keep, keep you or your family, friends, neighbors, or colleagues from reporting hate incidents and crimes, and what can we do to encourage people to report them? Um, I would say um, our environment has changed. Um, we hear hate more often. Um, I'm almost on a daily basis. Um, we see it online. Um, we get it with looks. We um, we receive it. Even question myself reporting. Um, being threatened before, am I being too dramatic? Um, should I really report this? Um, so it's, I guess it's just knowing, you know, who to call, when to call, um, the community feeling comfortable to call, um, that people are going to respond to it um, in such a way that we aren't seeing, I'm not seeing as too dramatic, but it's a legitimate you know, when somebody says they're going to shoot you or, you know, somebody leaves a dead animal on your porch, which I've had happen. Um, I've been spit at. I've been called names. Uh, we've been protested at our pride events, and I've stood outside and been screamed at for hours um, by individuals. And one, just reporting it, um, 
but also on another side of that, like having mental, like making sure that you're having like um, your mental health, you know, talking to your friends, knowing who you can talk to to talk through that, um, having people with you there. Um, but I think like just knowing who to call, when to call, I'm feeling comfortable to call. I can't imagine I was listening to Allie and I, um, I mean, I haven't had that happen. I was going to talk about what I've seen my kids ha happen to them, but I mean, it doesn't compare. So I would just say what my concern is, is um, the fear is one thing, being afraid is one thing, but the thing that concerns me more than fear is apathy. Because, and, and Allie, correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like it's been normalized. A lot of this hate has been normalized. Um, you know, I, I'm one of the older guys up here, but I, I don't remember seeing this. When I went to school, I mean, we would have had one of these. I, I grew up, I was Jewish in Charleston. I like Huntington more, but I'm a Charlestonian. Um, no offense. Huntington's much better. I'm not just saying that, seriously. Uh, there's a reason I moved. But... I grew up and I never had any issues at all, never. Grew up, went through schools, went to New York City, didn't even have any issues in New York City, went to New Orleans. Um, the last few years have been crazy. I've had stuff dropped on my lawn, anti-Jewish anti stuff dropped on my lawn. Um, and um, I lost a friend over it because uh, he accused me of clutching at my proverbial pearls. Uh, how, you know, come on. I mean, get serious, Hoyt. I've known this guy for 40 years. And he's, I lost, I mean, it's time to unfriend. So my concern is, I, I mean, I do think there's a lot of apathy and a lot of this is the new normal now. So I'm happy about participating in this because I just think you just keep the fight up, keep up the good fight, be vocal, report it, and do the best you can because it, it's going to require constant vigilance to change this culture. If I think of... I guess myself 10 years ago compared to where I'm at now, um, my answers are different. Um, 10 years ago, um, with the amount of families, mentees, um, students um, looking up to me, um, you know, really wanting to see the positive view of a, you know, of a black male. Um, if there would have been any, whether it be a hate crime incident, whatnot, um, I probably would not have said anything because there's a certain level of positivity, there's a certain level of pride, a certain level of, um, I guess, just that feeling of wanting them to see the good and not the bad, wanting them to see you know, the, the light and not the darkness. Um, and, you know, with that, you know, no matter what the situation you know may bring if it was a if it was a negative situation that would come my way you know i would not share that you know with any of the individuals i would be around um, because i wanted to have that you know that positive light so answering the question now though is people need to be able to see that transparency that Sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes good people are not in the right environment for them. And they, they have to be able to grow from those occurrences. And if you don't, if you don't learn from someone who experiences the, the bad, the negative, or anything of that nature, then you're not going to know how to prepare yourself mentally, physically, emotionally for those situations. So, you know, my focus now is more of it's it's not enough to just be on the positive side of things. You you need to be able to see both sides. You need to be able to be transparent 
you know, the good days, the bad days, the days you deserve, the days you don't deserve. People need to be able to see that and be able to understand, you know, that you can grow from those things and that you can be better and that we can we build from that to have a better future. As I was listening to um, Allie speak about personal hate that she had experienced, it's really heartbreaking, really, um, because I personally have never experienced that, and it is heartbreaking to hear that, you know, we're all in this world together, and we're trying to get through this as safely and, as, and make a good life for ourselves, and she's experiencing that, and it's heartbreaking. Um, but the question at hand was, um, what would stop myself or, or a colleague or a family member from actually reporting a hate crime? And um, I, I think a lot of people have just gotten numb in society and they just don't want to get involved if you were a bystander and saw something. Um, you know, maybe maybe the person may not want to just get themselves involved into something if it if it wasn't life threatening. Um, and then maybe fear of retribution. I don't know. Um, I just know that you know, with myself and our organization, we are there to take care of our disability community. And if anyone did come to our organization for asking or, or telling us of a, an experience that they had, we would not hesitate one minute to report that for them on their behalf because that is we are an advocacy group. So we would we would be their advocate in at a moment's notice. So listening to Ali again makes me feel like hey I'm all right. <laughs> You know, nobody spit on me and nobody, uh, they screamed at me uh, some uh, nasty names, but hey, what the heck. In comparison to you, Ali, I guess I'm fine. But that what stops people from reporting, really, I'm going to talk, to me, a lot of these things that I encounter, it has gone a lot worse after certain candidate and certain presidency because the more people hear this horrible rhetoric, subhuman, these people are not a human. So they start to buy into this concept and they become callous and they think truthfully, things gotten a lot worse after 2016 because people now think they have now open right to attack anything and anyone they feel like. You just don't want you to be here. But when it comes to my community, I was told many times, don't raise a stink. Keep it low. Don't let them know we are here. Don't let them know we exist. We are already faced with too many uh, uh, negative things. In the school now, after October the 7th, if a kid wore a kufiye, they've been harassed. They've been called name. Even if they weren't wearing anything that reference Gaza or anything, and what do the parent? What did the parents do? They didn't even went to talk to the teacher or the principal. You know why? Because we don't want them to get upset about the rest of the kids. So one of my members happened to be coach, and he went and talked to the child who called them name, and who's been focusing on this one individual because he perceived that little boy as weak. But. These things happen, and the idea is don't make wave. Just, you know what they say? Typical. I'm sorry. I don't mean anybody in this room. It's just white trash talk. It's not right. It's not fair. But a, a young man going to eat dinner three weeks ago in Morgantown, West Virginia at 930, he got beaten by four people his jaw broken, he came down from his apartment, went to get something to eat at 9.30 p.m. 
he didn't report. I mean, that got to be reported, but initially he called his uh, roommate and told him not to say anything to his parents. But his parents got really worried, and they do happen to be from Palestine. So when do you report and when you don't report? Am I going to report every woman who stared at me? Heck no. Am I going to report a truck driver who follows me because he's crazy? No, I'm sorry. He may never see me again. I'm, I mean, it's difficult to know. Now, if I, somebody threw uh, something at my mosque, yes. If somebody attacked my car, yes. Uh, I've been on the news a lot in the past four months. He told me so. <laughs> so I start to worry about my safety personally. Because I do speak out. I do speak out and I don't stay quiet. What's right is right and what has to be said has to be said. And we do have saying in the Quran, in Allah la yistahi min al haq. God does not shy away from truth and justice. So what do I report to you, Mr. Thompson? I want to make your good things. I want yes. to report who you follow. Yeah. We're not going to prosecute somebody for following you. You know. But we're going to know who that person is. Yes. But so if you, a couple of years ago when we had a person in Flatwood area uh, running around riding on his back of the truck, a uh, Muslim die or something like that, we did report that. Because we had many young ladies going up and down Morgantown, so the parents, their answer to them is what? Don't drive on home anymore. Stay there. We'll come and see you. Now, every young man and every young lady is instructed not to walk alone. Don't go out in one. Go out in two or three in a group. Don't, don't walk by yourself, especially if you are wearing hijab. Do not do that because harassment on college campuses have went up a lot. A lot. Is it reported? No, sir. It's not. They keep saying to you, I mean, I have to study. I'm not worried about this idiot who talk, you know, cussed me out or called me name or, or. So what the community does to protect itself, it tries to keep, you know, inside, try to, when if something happening, don't go out. And, well, women, don't go out in groceries today. There was a murder happened somewhere and we might be hit for it. We don't, we stay home. One nice friend of mine kept saying to me, I'll take you shopping. If you need anything, I'll join you. I said, no, I don't really care. He wants to, whoever wants to shoot me, go for it. I'm an old woman and I lived long enough. So it's really difficult. I know it's important and I tell my community that, very important to report that this uh, soccer coach who said to me, have to protect the rest of the kids. So he went and talked to him, and you wouldn't dare talk to the parents either. Uh, the parents of that bully, you wouldn't dare talk to them. Because they take retaliation against other kids who looks like them. I'm sorry. All right, um, got a question, a couple of questions here about domestic violence. Uh, basically, why don't we treat victims of domestic violence as hate crime victims? Because usually it's against a particular gender. I'm not, there is some circumstances of domestic violence that could be a hate crime. Uh, but uh, a generally interesting legal theory. Uh, it's something I'll think about. Uh, but domestic violence has its own set of problems um, and should, you know, we could do in another entire forum on domestic violence. Uh, so there's a couple questions on that. I'm going to save that those for another forum. Uh, we got time for one more question, and I'm curious as the responses on this. And this right here is sort of a call to action. What can the individuals here do before they leave this building tonight to begin to prevent and respond to hate crimes in this community? Thank you. Uh, be involved. As one of the gentlemen said, show up, uh, or Ali said it actually, 
show up when there is a function that you can learn from, that you get to know the other, the other, whoever the other might be. And be involved in the community. Don't be just a bystander looking uh, at hateful rhetorics and listening and buying into hateful rhetorics and, and the idea of, you know, these people don't belong, so we don't want them there. Close the border. Close the border. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. But remember, this is a nation that was built on immigrants. It, it was never a white, white, 100% white nation. It never was, and it will never be. Because we, ha we are a country of mixed ethnicity, of mixed faith. Islam hasn't been here just recently. Islam been here since uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson read, read the Quran here. So, but we used to keep low profile, now we're open. Now people know where Syria is. People used to ask me if I'm driving to Syria, Damascus, Syria, you know. But now with the social media and everything, everybody knows everybody. Get to know your neighbor. Take action, participate, get involved. And please, whatever you do, have a heart. Have a heart. The person you're looking at may be having a very bad day. The best thing you could do is smile in their face. Smile in our faith is called sadaka, which is a charity. Smile at somebody, believe me, it often makes my day. Sometimes I wonder, today is a good day, what's going on? Nobody slammed the door at me in my face. Nobody gave me dirty look. Ugh, something happening. But please do get involved. Get to know your neighbor. Thank you. Again, as, as an organization, we will be there for the consumers that we serve. And I think leaving here today just to be able to uh, teach safety to them to where they understand that there are people out there in this world that are not like you specifically that would want to maybe potentially harm you or to discriminate against you. So again, you know, our organization is there to be the advocate for that individual with a disability. And um, along with our advocacy and our peer support there that are our core uh, services that we provide that will be there for them and for them to understand that. And that's probably, you know, we can do more advocating uh, and teaching as the days go forward for them. Um, one, just thank you for coming and listening and being here and present at this event. Um, I would ask that you go out and have conversations within the community and domino effect um, what you've heard um, here. Um, I would love to challenge HPD to uh, make some social media posts on how to report hate crimes that can be shared within our community. Um, and also uh, taking um, the trainings that are offered for different minority groups and show up to our events, you know what I mean? Like come and be visible, take action, and just be kind to your neighbors. I'll be brief, like others have said, I mean, you're, you're all here and that's the first step, the journey. Uh, become the change we seek, just keep doing what you're doing, spread the word. I'm very big on uh, reflection, uh, so I would, I would definitely encourage you to reflect. Um, you know, two things that I uh, tell myself each day um, is, you know, if something is mentionable, then it can be manageable. And at the same time, um, pain makes one think, thought makes one wise, wisdom makes life bearable. So when you take the time to reflect and really understand, take time to understand the individuals, you know, who are around you um, and what might be causing them pain 
you know, discovered, um, you know, any type of um, um, fear, nervousness, anything that, you know, that they may, you know, be hard to really, you know, say aloud, you know, if you really take the time to um, approach that person genuinely with, you know, nothing but from a pure heart standpoint and just asking them if they are okay, you know, if there is something that they need, you know, you know, those are steps that you can take, you know, to be able to, you know, one person can affect three and then that three can do six and it just keeps building um, upon that. And, you know, that that's what it's all about, you know, being able to reflect on what changes, what actions, what little steps can you take personally um, that can allow you to make a difference in someone else's life. And then that just starts chipping away at the issues, at the concerns, at the um, fears, at, you know, at the, um, just the different elements that we might not know, you know, right now, but we can find out just by being genuine and then allowing someone to be open to us. In closing, I'd like to really thank, first of all, everyone for coming to. Uh, you can. Yes. Great evidence, don't get me wrong, but I don't want you to put yourself in harm's way. Does that make sense? Like I said, it's great evidence, you know, but I don't want anybody, um, we've got trained law enforcement members here. I don't want you to put yourself at unnecessary risk, but I would love to have the evidence. Does that make sense? All right. Um, I want to thank everyone here for coming tonight. Uh, the mayor's going to come up in just a moment and bid us farewell. But I really appreciate all the panel's uh, contributions tonight. Uh, some of them might be a little bit shy, but they're still up here talking about some really tough things going on in their life. And I don't think any of them did this for applause, but I think they all deserve applause. <laughs> mayor Williams. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. What a tremendous panel. And uh, it's been food, certainly food for thought. Thank you for taking time. Sue, thanks for coming all the way over here. <laughs> really appreciate you uh, do, doing this. Um, the last comments of the panel um, summed an awful lot up. I took three very specific um, suggestions. Be aware. Be aware of what is going about us. Open our eyes. Be prepared. Because once we are aware then we have an opportunity to be prepared to at least take the information and get it to where it needs to be, or to be prepared to just walk over near someone and be able to, to show a tender moment and actually get in the way of, or at least stop what was going on, not necessarily to say something, but just you interrupt. So being aware, being prepared, and just be. Be, which will lead to you doing. 
What we've tried to create in Huntington is an environment where there are safe spaces. Um, we've been very strategic in how we have, what we have structured. Originally, we created the mayor's advisory LGBTQIA, the mayor's LGBTQ advisory committee. Very strategic. It's not something that was created by law. It's an advisory committee where we had the first conversations when we first met. Here's this, at that time I was in my late 50s, not where I am now, on the other side of the 60s, but this late 50s white straight male and I'm dealing with issues within the community as related to the LGBTQ com community. And when I came in with the meeting, I said, we need to have a safe space. Because I'm asking you to advise me on policy. And as you're advising me on policy, I, n I know I'm going to say something really stupid. Or I'm going to say something that not even knowing that I'm being offensive. So please forgive me, but let this be a safe space so that you can straighten me out and help me understand why that was offensive or why that was stupid. By doing that immediately, what I found is that love just poured out in the room. And I've created wonderful relationships. That led to making sure that this wasn't just an LGBTQ advisory committee that we needed to expand. My advisory members came to me and said, Mayor, there's much, much more than just LGBTQ. Let's have an advisory committee on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that has grown. And it's amazing what we're seeing in, in this town. The first Pride, we had a Pride picnic, a couple of Pride picnics, but then we had the Pride um, festival. I kept wanting to say parade, but it was a festival. There was, what I ended up finding is there was one person over standing over at the side. I was out of town on meetings, but I heard about this one individual standing over in the side with these hateful signs. And it was a hot, hot day. And after a while, people started taking water over to him and giving him something to drink, being kind to him. Guess what? He packed up and left. <laughs> Which leads to another point. As you act, you will cause people to react. Love one another. So as we have an action plan, yes, I have two advisory committees that make sure that when we're driving policy, those of you who know me, I really don't want to wait on and copy anything off of anybody else. I want us to be first. I want us to be uh, breaking out on our, on our own because if you try to copy what somebody else is doing, you're going to come across as nothing but a cheap imitation. Let's be true to who we are. This is a community of compassion. And it's incredible to see what has developed in, in this community. And as I watched in our police department, how our police department responds in a caring, caring, compassionate manner. We created 
the Hu Huntington Human Relations Commission. Marshall Moss is, wave your hand, Marshall. In the back, he has a, uh, has a table in, in back. It had been disbanded. And we were looking to be able to make sure that we could put this back in place. Well, that, when we put it before council, it passed unanimously. But we also, we also had uh, an ordinance that was, was passed on discrimination, making sure that discriminatory acts that we stated very specifically what they were for, um, for sexual orientation and disability, that passed unanimously. The clergy didn't come out, the churches didn't come out, the faith, the faith community didn't come out and speak against it. It passed unanimously. We have this in this town, but let's also, while we're being, let's be real, there is hatred within the world. And... I'm awfully concerned with the tenor of the public discourse. And I'm absolutely convinced that the only way to be able to fight back against that is not to yell or make, make to, to draw into an argument on this, is just to be. Don't allow yourself to be pulled down. We can't allow our community to be pulled down. Love one another. So we have the structure within policy. We have the structure within our community to be able to do some powerful things. But the call to action really comes down to this. What are you ready to do? What are you ready to stand for? Now, I'm speaking beyond this room because you've taken time to come in here and obviously you're prepared to, to do what's necessary and being able to show the compassion that the world needs to see. But those who are hearing my voice and hearing our voices, I had a, my grandfather said, your name will go places your face will never see. And nowadays, our voices will go places that we will never see. Let's make sure that what we're, we are doing and you're determining how you're going to respond, what you are going to be. Be compassionate. Be caring. And show people that you're from Huntington. Thanks for taking time for coming out this evening and we'll be seeing each other in the neighborhoods. Thank you.